Hello, and welcome to the History of the Railways, a podcast with the ridiculous goal of telling the story of the railways across the world. Season 1, Episode 6, The LMDMR, Part 1, The Fight for an Idea. In the last episode, we saw how Rocket, the engine that would become so closely associated with George Stevenson, won the day at Rain Hill, and in doing so proved that steam locomotives really were a suitable motive force to run a railway line. Today, we're going to jump back in time slightly and tell the story of the birth of the railway that ran those trials, the Liverpool and Manchester. More specifically, we're going to look at the struggle to get the idea for the Liverpool and Manchester off the ground, and how it almost fell at the first hurdle. But before we do, we need to answer our last trivia question. On the last episode, I asked, what was the official speed of the fastest steam locomotive, the A4-4468 Mallard? And the answer was 126.3 miles an hour. The 462 Pacific hit this speed on the 3rd of July 1938, going down Stoke Bank, beating the previous world record of 124.5 miles per hour that had been set by the German DRG class 05002 in May 1936. If you said 125 miles per hour, then I guess you can give yourself a point as well. Are we keeping score here? Anyway, Gresley preferred 125 because the engine maintained it for slightly longer, so that was the number that the LNER used in the publicity at the time, but the dynamometer recorded a top speed of 126.3. Okay, on with the show. But let's start with a straightforward question. Why Liverpool and Manchester? There have been settlements at Liverpool and Manchester for a fair old time. Manchester was founded by the Romans in the year 79, and appears by name in the Doomsday Book written a thousand years later in 1086. Liverpool is a latecomer by comparison. The earliest record of it doesn't appear until the 12th century. So they'd been around for a while, but the Industrial Revolution caused both to grow beyond all recognition. By 1830, Liverpool was home to about 160,000 people, and Manchester 140,000, making them the second and third biggest conurbations in England. For comparison, Edinburgh at the time had a population the same as Liverpool's of about 160,000, and London, always an outlier, had a population in the region of 1.6 million. But first, with apologies to everybody listening in the UK, where are Liverpool and Manchester? It always annoys me when people talk about places and just assume you'll know where they are, and in this case where they are matters, because it's what drove the people who set up the line. So for those of you who don't have the geography of Britain committed to memory, Liverpool is on the coast on the northwest of England. And when I say England, that's what I mean. The northwest of England is about halfway up the northwest of Britain. If you imagine the outline of Britain, then Liverpool is just above Wales. And if you don't know where Wales is, it's the lumpy bit sticking out on the left. Manchester is at the same latitude, give or take, and 30 to 35 miles inland from Liverpool. So why does it matter where they are? Well, We saw during episode 3 that geography was the driving force of the Stockton and Darlington line. The directors were originally looking to connect coal fields to markets. Later, during the railway mania, there was a pretty low bar to get a line started. If you could convince people the two end points existed, you were off to the races. I imagine the only reason I haven't found a prospectus for the Camelot and Narnia line in the archives is that C.S. Lewis hadn't been born yet. But in 1830, that wasn't true. If you wanted to get a railway line built, you needed a good reason. Liverpool and Manchester had that good reason, and while it wasn't about coal fields, it was still about geography. Connecting the two cities, not that either of them was technically a city at this point, Manchester became a city in 1853 and Liverpool in 1880, but anyway, connecting them was essential to trade. For the merchants of Liverpool, there were clear benefits of getting access to another large population you could sell things to. And the same is true the other way round, of course, but to the people of Manchester, getting a decent connection to Liverpool had another advantage. It was a port. And that was even more important than we might realise today. If you were a merchant in Manchester, then clearly access to the sea was necessary to export anything abroad. What's less obvious to us now is that the sea was often the easiest way to transport goods around the UK as well. Without reliable roads, getting to the nearest part of the coast and moving your goods via water was sometimes more cost-efficient than trying to move it across land. As we saw in the last episode, for example, when Robert Stevenson wanted to move Rocket to the Rainhill Trials from Newcastle in the northeast, he did so via the sea. 
A straight line over land between Newcastle and Rainhill is about 110 miles. But instead of travelling those 110 miles over land, Robert Stevenson chose to travel 70 miles cross-country to Bowness and then add another 100 or so miles by sea. Since Robert was no idiot, it gives us a good indication of the state of the roads at the time. If you lived in Manchester and wanted to sell your goods within the UK, then getting to a port was just as important to you as if you wanted to sell them in Germany. So, a reliable link between Manchester and Liverpool was key. As you'd expect if you've listened to any of the earlier episodes, people had recognised the need to link them before the railway, and the solution was a canal. Or in this case, actually three canals, sort of. The Mersey and Irwell navigation was an expansion of the rivers rather than a real canal, but the result is the same. I'm not going to dwell on the canals here, but one at least was very interesting, as it was the first true canal in Britain, the Bridgewater Canal built by the 3rd Duke of Bridgewater between 1759 and about 1765. Well, not directly by the Duke. You can see a picture of him on the website, and I think you'll agree it's unlikely he did much of the digging himself. But he was a pioneer. One thing in particular about the Bridgewater that has a bearing on our story here is the use of a trust. The Duke died in 1803 without children or an heir to the dukedom, so he arranged to leave his canal company in the hands of a trust, which acted on behalf of the Marquess of Stafford, his nephew. And this is a total aside, but I can't let it pass. For those of you with any knowledge or interest in the Highland clearances, it's worth knowing that this Marquess of Stafford is the same man as that Duke of Sutherland. He's notorious under his ducal title for relocating almost 15,000 people from his wife's million-acre estate in Scotland. Because, you know, sheep. Anyway, that aside, it's not important for our story to understand the ridiculously convoluted ways that different British titles and property are inherited, nor, sadly, how the tenants of these people were treated, but given how the LNMR directors of the line solved some of their challenges, it is important to know that the person who a trust is set up for, that is, the guy who gets the money from it, and it's almost always a guy, usually isn't the person running the trust. And that was definitely true for the Bridgewater Trust, the income from the trust made the Marquess of Stafford one of the wealthiest men in the country, but he had nothing to do with running it, he just got the checks. Day-to-day -day management of the Canal Trust, and all of the decisions it took, was done on his behalf by three men, which, as you can imagine, made them powerful men in their own right. But only one of them really matters for our story, Robert Bradshaw. So, when you hear me talk about the Bridgewater Canal Party, I'm really talking about the trustees, and basically Bradshaw. So by the early 1820s, when our railway story gets going, the canals have been operating for years, but a combination of the volume of traffic, their unreliability due to tides and the weather, and the rates the canal companies charged, meant that some of the businessmen of Liverpool and Manchester were looking for alternatives. Jumping ahead slightly, the following statement, signed by more than 150 Liverpool merchants, gives us the tone. We, the undersigned, merchants and brokers resident in the port of Liverpool, do hereby declare that we have for a long time past experienced great difficulty in obtaining vessels to convey goods from this place to Manchester, and that the delay is highly prejudicial to the trading and manufacturing interest at large, that we consider the present establishments for the transport of goods quite inadequate, and that a new line of conveyance has become absolutely necessary to conduct the increasing trade of the country with speed, certainty and economy. With the development of the S&DR a pace nearby, some men thought the answer was obvious. A railway. Railways linking the cities had been suggested by William Jessop and Benjamin Outram, both of whom I've mentioned in passing in our story before, but in 1822 a man arrived in Liverpool who would be the real motivating force behind the line that would finally get built. William James. James had made a fortune as a lawyer and land agent, and was a very early convert to the idea of railways. His daughter Ellen's 1861 biography said that he was writing about potential railways in his diaries from as early as 1799, and by 1808 he was projecting a general railroad company that would run lines across the country. It is worth noting that her biography takes a very generous view of her father's role in the wider railway age, but given that she's quoting his diaries and letters about the LNMR, I think we can trust it in this case. And to be fair, you can hardly blame her for fighting his corner. She was reacting to the same Samuel Smiles book about George Stevenson, which we saw in the last episode, the one that credited him with just about everything short of curing the common cold, and that managed to upset Timothy Hackworth's family as well. 
But whether some of Ellen's biography is a reach or not, we know for sure that by the late teens and early 1820s, James was carrying out surveys for a variety of railways at his own expense. And in 1822, he came to Liverpool to do the same thing, and met a wealthy Liverpool corn merchant, Joseph Sanders. Sanders was impressed by James's railway ideas and saw it as a way of breaking the hold that the canal companies had over the trade between Liverpool and Manchester. So he agreed to provide James with funds to survey the route. James carried out his survey in late 1822 with a small group of associates, including none other than Robert Stevenson, then only 19 and fresh off surveying the Stockton and Darlington line. Although I say carried out his survey, uh, it makes it sound much easier than it was. James's survey encountered the same kind of difficulties that all of the later surveys would experience. The terrain itself provided plenty of difficulties. James apparently nearly disappeared into Chat Moss at one point, narrowly escaping with his life when he was pulled free, soaking wet and covered in muck from the bog. But that was as nothing compared to the opposition from the landowners, as we'll see later. Through 1823, James wrote up his surveys and produced plans for the line. Unfortunately, though, he was more of a starter than a finisher and had several big projects on the go at the same time, and it caught up with him. He was arrested for debt and remanded to the King's Bench Debtors' Prison, where, by coincidence, Isambard Kingdom Brunel's father Mark had spent three months a couple of years earlier. And that isn't as necessarily as bad as it sounds to us now. The terms varied, but prisoners for debt could have their family with them, and even in some cases live outside the prison as long as they stayed nearby but it can't have helped his reputation with the well-to-do businessmen in Liverpool and Manchester. We don't know the terms of James's imprisonment, but he definitely continued to work on plans for some railways while he was a prisoner. Unfortunately, though, he didn't get the plans for the LNMR complete in time for the deadline to submit them to the 1823 parliamentary session, and his relationship with Sanders and the LNMR committee broke down completely. In spring 1824, things on the potential Liverpool and Manchester railway came to a head. In May, Sanders wrote what can only be described as a quite snotty letter to James, telling him that, By delay and promises, you have forfeited the confidence of the subscribers, and that they had engaged your friend Mr G. Stevenson as the engineer in James's place. Sanders asked James for copies of the plans he had made, but he refused. Sadly for James, his brother-in-law, who had been his second in command on the survey, handed over the plans in exchange for a job. James was understandably outraged, writing to his son. The reason you have not heard from Padley, that's the brother-in-law, is that he has made terms with George Stevenson, so he is lost to us forever. He knows my plans, of which he and Stevenson will now avail themselves. I confess I did not calculate upon such duplicity in either. Stevenson will now get so important. James's daughter's version of events has her father as the victim of a grand conspiracy, from the original charge of debt that got him thrown into prison, all the way through to how Sanders and Stevenson treated him. And having read the extracts of James's letters that are available, I can tell you he seems to have felt the same way. But was there a conspiracy? We don't really know. James let the LNMR committee down. But did they need to jettison him quite so quickly and without warning? And did George Stevenson need to accept additional work over the head of his supposed friend? At best, it was opportunistic and selfish. But that doesn't necessarily make it a plan to oust him. Apparently it was clear to James, though. From what we can tell, he never forgave either man. He maintained a deep feeling of betrayal against both Sanders and George Stevenson for the rest of his life. His relations with Robert Stevenson, on the other hand, who he'd worked with directly on the survey, seemed to have stayed good. But then at this time, Robert's own relationship with George seems to have been strained as well. Cast your mind back to episode three, when I was discussing the Stockton and Darlington line, and you'll remember that Robert Stevenson shocked his partners by signing a contract to work in South America for three years. They'd known he was going abroad, but understood that it was for a matter of months, not years. Well, that was happening at precisely the same time as William James was receiving such shabby treatment from the hands of his father. In April 1824, despite the fact that, on paper at least, he was the head of Robert Stevenson and Company, while James was in serious financial difficulty, Robert had written to his old boss asking him for work. Nothing came of that, as you might expect. James was hardly in any state to give Robert a job. But just two months later, Robert secretly signed a three-year contract and sailed for Columbia, leaving his father and the company that bore his own name behind him. 
Now, in later life, there's no record of Robert saying anything other than positive things about his father. But in 1824, at least, it seems that there was some source of friction between them. It's intriguing to speculate if George's treatment of William James was a part of this, but of course we can't ever know. Anyway, by the time Robert sailed away, James's involvement in the line had come to an end. He was out, and George Stevenson was in. Outside of railway historians, James's name is hardly known. Whether he deserves quite as much praise as his daughter would have given him, I can't say, but one thing is pretty obvious. He certainly deserves more than he gets. By mid-1824, Joseph Sanders must have felt confident that he'd found his man when he saw the passion and drive that George Stevenson brought to his role. This was the man that was going to save the line. Having missed the previous parliamentary session, it was now essential that they get moving if they were to get approval for their line. Luckily for Sanders, among the many fair and unfair criticisms that were levelled at George over the years, no one ever accused him of laziness. He wasted no time in organising another survey and immediately ran into challenges that made the fight with the Earl of Darlington over the S&DR look like a walk in the park. In the words of Henry Booth, the committee anticipated a strenuous opposition and they were not disappointed. Presumably they weren't surprised either though, as they did rather bring the opposition on themselves. The prospectus the committee released on the 29th of October stated that it will be perceived that the road does not approach within about a mile and a half of the residence of the Earl of Sefton, and that it traverses the Earl of Derby's property over the barren mosses of Kirby and Knowsley, passing about two miles distance from the hall. But that was slightly disingenuous. Notice that it said the residence of Sefton. The committee knew full well that their proposed line did still cross his land, which he'd repeatedly said he didn't want. Predictably, neither of the earls was satisfied and nor was Robert Bradshaw, the Bridgewater trustee that we introduced earlier. The three men did everything they could to stop Stevenson getting access to their land. And I do mean everything they could. Both sides published pamphlets supporting their claims. Bradshaw's told the locals all about the dangers of inevitably exploding steam engines that the line was going to use. We know, of course, that the committee hadn't even decided for sure to use steam engines at this point, but he wasn't going to let a little thing like facts get in the way of making his point. And to be fair, the Railway Committee didn't have any stronger attachment to the truth either. According to Fernie Ho's 1980 history of the line, they forged a letter saying that Lord Sefton had given permission for the survey to take place and then sent it to all of the Earl's tenants. But that was just the war of words. George Stevenson and his team of surveyors on the ground were probably more concerned by the physical one. On the 19th of October, George wrote to Edward Pease, who he was still working for on the s and I remember. The letter was mostly concerned with whether to use iron or stone for a bridge on the s and but in a PS, he shares some of the tactics that Sefton, Derby and Bradshaw had descended to. Their ground is blockaded on every side to prevent us getting on with the survey. Bradshaw fires guns through his grounds in the course of the night to prevent the surveyor coming on in the dark. Women and children from the villages threw stones at the surveyors and fights between the surveyors and the locals were so common that navvies were brought on the survey just to act as muscle. When George later provided evidence to Parliament, who referred back to this time and told the MPs, I was threatened to be ducked in the pond if I proceeded, and I was twice turned off the ground myself by his men, Mr Bradshaw's, and they said if I did not go instantly, they would take me up and carry me off to Worsley. Of course, he glossed over the fact that it was a two-way street, in the same letter to Pease that I'd quoted earlier, he'd said, We are to have a grand field day next week. The Liverpool railway people are determined to force a survey through if possible. Lord Sefton says he will have a hundred men against us. The company think those great men have no right to stop a survey. At the time, a field day still had the military meaning it started with. Although we don't read anything of the outcome, it's clear that Stevenson at least was expecting a literal pitched battle. All of this just goes to show a weird consequence of the British legal position I described in episode one. To approve a railway company, Parliament insisted on seeing a set of detailed plans and surveys of the land where the line would run. If they approved the act, then the company would try to buy the land on the plan, and if they weren't able to come to terms with the landowners, then the act would give them the right to compulsorily purchase it. But if the landowner didn't want to sell, they didn't have to let you on their land to make the survey in the first place. No survey, no act. No act, no compulsory purchase. It's no wonder that the landowners put up such a struggle at this stage. 
But all of that said, this was playing to George Stevenson's strengths. He was used to other people's doubts, and he had the gumption and sheer drive to push a project through despite massive odds. So by February 1825, he had overcome all of the resistance, completed the plans, and the bill was read in Parliament for the first time. On the 21st of March, it moved to committee. Here, to Sanders' disappointment, George was to prove much less effective. For what it's worth, I think genius is an overused word these days, but George Stevenson undoubtedly had something of the genius about him. But it was a type of genius that was never going to be easy for lawyers and parliamentarians to appreciate. He was self-taught, having developed his mechanical engineering skills from scratch in the collieries of Durham. He learned civil engineering on the line at Stockton and Darlington. His ability to absorb knowledge of practical matters was second to none. However, he wasn't a bookish man. In fact, he didn't learn to read or write until after he was 18, and he never did either well. For most of his life, he dictated his letters, and either Robert or a secretary would write them for him. He was obstinate, rough around the edges, and had already conceived a dislike for the educated London set following his run-in with Sir Humphrey Davy over his safety lamp. He had a chip on his shoulder, and sometimes it showed. None of this would go down very well in a parliamentary committee today. In 1825, when the majority of the MPs were from the aristocracy or landed classes, it went down like a lead balloon. But truth be told, he also performed badly. He wasn't prepared, and it showed. To get an idea of the process a potential railway act went through in the committee stage, just imagine any legal drama you've ever seen. Each side had an advocate, and they would call expert witnesses, who'd then be cross-examined by the opposition. The only addition is that the committee members themselves could also chime in with their own questions. In the case of the Eleanor Mars 1825 Act, each side called a number of experts. But as the line's engineer, George Stevenson's testimony was the most important. And it didn't go well. Henry Booth, writing once the line had successfully opened, said that a considerable error had been committed by the surveyors for the railway, which, when discovered, was acknowledged in committee. The impression on the committee, however, was unfavourable, and some degree of doubt and uncertainty was necessarily thrown on the whole of the surveying department. Which is pretty damning, but sadly understates things. George got mauled. Under cross-examination, he had to admit that he had made estimates for bridges with no idea of what they'd be made from, how many arches they'd have, or even how big they were. He hadn't taken borings to determine what type of ground the line was running over. And in many cases, he hadn't done the surveys himself at all, but left them to assistants. Then there's Chat Moss. The Moss would become part of George's hero myth. The so-called experts in London said it couldn't be done and mocked him relentlessly, only for the plucky northerner to prove them all wrong. And it's true that he did get mocked scathingly on the very idea of crossing Chat Moss. And as we'll see in the next episode, he definitely had the last laugh on that one. But to be completely honest, he might have been lucky. It's pretty clear that he didn't have a plan that would have got across the moss when he appeared before Parliament. His idea at the time seems to have been simply to tip in enough material to make a firm base for the embankment, just as he had done at the Boggy Myers Flat on the Stockton and Darlington. The stretch of the S&DR line that crossed Myers Flat had swallowed hundreds of tonnes of material, but when George was giving evidence to Parliament, it was finally progressing well. It would finish on the 11th of June 1825, only a couple of months after his evidence, and a couple of days after the result of the act. Having conquered one swamp no doubt bolstered George's confidence as he sat there answering questions from these men who had achieved nothing. But, as we'll see, that isn't how Chat Moss was crossed, and what he can't have known then was that his approach hadn't really worked at Myers Flat either. Four years later, the s and resident engineer admitted that the line at Myers Flat was still sinking as much as it had the year it was made. In 1828, they'd had to tip an additional £300 worth of material in and employ four men through the winter just to keep it from collapsing. That George Stevenson later managed to come up with a way to get across Chat Moss speaks to his indomitable strength of spirit and a credible plan that Parliament should have approved. There was the occasional flash of light relief where the railway scored a point against their opponents like when one of them suggested to John Erpeth Rastrick that the red-hot chimneys of steam locos would scare the horses they passed, and Rastrick replied that he wasn't sure how the horses would know they weren't just painted red. But George himself did terribly. He squirmed, 
demonstrated how little he knew of the detail on the ground and was led into contradicting himself on more than one occasion. What is the length of arching for which you have allowed £375? I have not taken the exact length. You did not consider it necessary to ascertain, previously or subsequently, what the work was for which you made an estimate? I thought it quite sufficient. Is that the way you estimate? Yes. And you have done so throughout the whole of the road? I have made measurements of the bridges for which I have made my calculations. Why did you measure at the bridges? To give me an idea what they cost. What is the width of the bridge over the River Irwell? Not the span of it, but the width of it. I have not made out the width, but perhaps 14 feet. So you make a bridge, perhaps 14 feet wide, perhaps 20 feet high, perhaps with three arches, perhaps with one, and then you boldly say that £5,000 is a proper estimate for it? I think so. We can only imagine how Joseph Sanders and the LNMR committee must have felt as they watched his performance. The committee took two and a half months to come to a decision, and the minutes run to 800 pages. George's direct evidence only lasted for three days, from the 25th to the 28th of April, and the committee continued to sit for another full month afterwards. But when the main opposing counsel summed up, he didn't miss the opportunity to drive home Stevenson's failure. What do you think of the ignorance of this gentleman, who chooses to have an impossible ditch, which he chooses to cut by the side of an impossible railway? Did you ever hear such ignorance as this? Whatever credit you might have been disposed to give to Mr Stevenson before, it is plainly shown now how utterly and totally devoid he is of common science. They say such is the plan that we have laid before Parliament, so absurd in all its parts that it is impossible anyone should know how to act upon it. If they cannot tell which is the way the road is to go, what is the committee to do? What but to throw out this bill with ignominy and contempt? On the 1st of June, the committee gathered at one o'clock and voted on the bill. As was the way of it with parliamentary committees, each clause had to be voted on in turn by the committee in secrecy. But in this case, the first clause would pretty much set the tone for their whole answer. Its title was, Company Entitled to Make a Railway from Liverpool to Manchester. The committee cleared the room, and the LNMR men presumably waited nervously to be called back in to hear the committee's decision. Before long, the ushers called the parties back into the room and they were gaveled to order. The clause was rejected. And that was it. The LNMR's council insisted on getting the committee's opinion on the second clause as well, which would have let them get the land they needed, but at this stage it was a lost cause. Sadly, it did give the opposition advocate another opportunity to interrupt with one final turn of the knife for George Stevenson. I object, sir, to the whole clause. You object to the whole of the clause? the chairman asked. I object to it on the ground of the inaccuracy of the plans and sections. Unsurprisingly, once they'd cleared the room again and gone through the motions, the committee rejected that clause as well. Finally, the LNMR Council laid down the fight. As you have taken out of the bill those two clauses, I will not trouble you any further, he said. If Sanders had been confident that he'd found his man when he replaced William James with George Stevenson, then there must have been part of him that regretted it now. The Liverpool and Manchester Railway was dead, and the blame had been laid squarely at George's door. And on that cliffhanger, we're going to leave the story for today. In the next episode, we'll see if, OK, how, the LNMR can recover from the kicking its chief engineer had taken. But before we go, here's today's trivia question. Appointed in 1837... Who was the Great Western Railway's first locomotive superintendent? As always, I'll give you the answer on the next episode, but if you can't wait that long, then check out historyoftherailways.com where you'll find episode show notes and the answer to today's question. And finally, can I ask you a favour? If you're enjoying the show, then please leave a review on Apple, YouTube or wherever you're listening. Good reviews mean that the show gets recommended to others and as a new show, everyone counts. Leaving a quick rating or a review is the best way you can help support the show for free. So don't wait any longer. Do it now. OK, with that out of the way, come and join me on the next episode as we look at how the Liverpool and Manchester claws its way back from the rejection of their bill to become famous as the first modern railway. If you're enjoying the show, please like, subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And remember, you can find relevant images and links to the source material I used for research 
and historyoftrailways.com, where you'll also find ways to support the show. If you want to get in touch, then just drop me a line at michael at historyoftherailways.com or follow us on Facebook and join the conversation there. So tell your friends to come and join us on the next episode as we get distracted, fascinated and yes, even sidetracked by the stories from the history of the railways.